Uh, give me an idea what that's like being in a group for 40 plus years and then emerging as a solo artist. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, this kind of group, I mean, Mother's Finest, it's not like there's a front person and then, and then a backing band or something. You know, we've always kind of looked at it as like everybody is a star. You know, on right. the stage, you look across and, you know, you go out and get what you possibly, anything you possibly can. And, you know, and, and have as much personality as you can to try to portray that to the people, you know, if they dig it. So, you know, we got rock and bass player and, uh, and you know, everybody on the band, killer drummer. And right. We want to just have the best of the best and everybody doing the best that they can. And, uh, you know, everybody's ego try to back off enough so that we can let it happen, you know. Uh, it's it's amazing. I mean, you're talking. That, that's how you stick around for forty years. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, that's how you make. I mean, bands life maybe five years if you're lucky. You know, that's a good yeah. long time for a band. Really, and, absolutely. Uh, it's to remarkable. To do it like we've done it, I mean, I'm really blessed too. I mean, we got it spread over. We've been together forty-seven years. We got exactly. together in 1970. Jeez, yeah, 47 and years, wow. 47 years, yeah, and then everybody still looks great. I you know. know. I mean, you know, that's, it's obviously we've been a long, long damn time, but, you know, everybody, we've been vegetarians most of the time, and everybody's real health conscious and try to stay away from drugs. You don't, don't do drugs, kids. Right, <laughs> right. I mean, that's... So, it's it's incredible. I mean, you guys uh, and have such a, a a deep history, and I mean, you guys have been everywhere. I mean, uh, you're still playing shows, touring, and uh, you know, I you know, we talked a little bit about uh, you know the pioneering aspect of it, but you know, the, the idea of blending hard rock with funk and with with soul. How did uh, you know that all kind of come together? If you don't mind, tell us a little bit about you know how you guys met up uh, back in the day 47 years ago. 40, yeah, well, I'll tell you, Joyce and Glenn, uh, they were a singing duo in the, in the late 60s, I guess, and uh, they had just gotten back from Taiwan. They took a gig uh, at an army base, and they were, you know, Joyce is dressed in a gown, and Murdoch was, you know, in a suit and everything, and they go and play the show sets in the clubs, you know, and put the microphones on the floor and sing If I Had a Hammer, right. I Had a Hammer in the Morning. And, you know, it really got over good because people love that, you know, but it was real straight, conservative, and uh, they wanted to do something wild, man. It was the end of the 60s, and they'd heard about acid and pot. and Right. right. <laughs> and they just uh, wanted to try the lifestyle, not necessarily the drugs, but uh, to try to do something that they felt they wanted to do because they loved Sly Stone and, uh, you know, those kind of bands that were really freaking at the time. You know, that was rocking then, you know. Right. And, uh, so they did their last gig at a, in Dayton, Ohio, where I'm from, and at the place called the Golden Lion, and uh, played their show, and then they asked the club owner if they could uh, stay over a week as the dance band. And when they did that, uh, he said, cool, yeah, he'd love to have them, because they were still a draw, but they were just playing the dance sets. And uh, that weekend before they started, we they got me, I was playing in a band as the dance band the week before. So I got with them, and we had another guitar player, which I can't even remember his name, and another bass player that only lasted a couple of weeks, and a drummer that was our, with us for like the first two or three months. But the three of us were together, and we learned the you know our favorite songs that we could play for a long time. Right. You know, I Want to Take You Higher, and uh, you know a bunch of like, you know, some Nike and Tina Turner songs. I only knew three or four songs pretty good. But we played the set, and the place was standing on the tables. You wow. know, it was just going crazy, and uh, and we were playing loud and rocking out, and everybody we had the freedom to do whatever they wanted to do, and it was completely different than what they'd been doing, and myself too, you know, because we were automatically started out the gate blending, you know, the funky music with the rock, right. and uh, I think anytime you blend two kinds of music together, you get a good result. You know, it's yeah. almost always experimental, but just the blend itself, there's not a path to follow so you end up coming with something original you know well i mean and it was it apparent you know when you guys got together and you started playing music that uh, you know that, that this was something unique i mean did you guys kind of like wow we've we got something here was it very kind of quick um, oh yeah absolutely because like i say we played the dance set and we only had this crowd up on this little tiny <laughs> stage and the cl club was packed because you know everybody really Joyce and Glenn were popular on their own right. singing straight stuff so they, those people all came and the other people all came that you know were just interested to see what, what was going to happen and uh, we didn't even try man and the people were listening and uh, 
that made it really special because it was doing just what we wanted to do, no holds barred, you know, it was rocking out and uh, plenty of freedom, do what you like. And uh, everybody picked up on it immediately, including us, you know. Right. We figured this, this is happening, this is working. The idea of combining a couple kinds of music, just anything you try it would work, you know. Uh, you know, that was, you said around 1970 or so? Yeah, 1970. And so by 72, you guys uh, get a record deal with MCA. Uh, how did you guys end up uh, getting getting the group together, and, and, and did you relocate to Atlanta at this point? No. Uh, at this point, we were in Ohio, and what the first thing we did was drive to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, because the bass player we only had for a couple of weeks. His wife lived down there, and they had a house. It was strange, too, because we drove down there. He said, yeah, you can live at my house, and... We got clubs to play, and uh, it's, it'll be great. And we got down there and found out he was having a fight with his wife. So <laughs> he promised. So he moved us in the house with his wife. <laughs> and unfortunately, she was just a sweetheart of a person, and she understood what was going on. But he couldn't live there because they were fighting. So that's the last <laughs> time we saw him, really. <laughs> Jeez, that's a situation. And we lived at the house for a couple of months, practiced every day. And uh, that's when we picked up Wizard in the uh, early on. Wow. Well, actually, we had Wizard's brother. And he played a few months with us and then came to practice one day and says, uh, I have to get married, but I'd like for you to, you know, I'm going to give you my brother. You'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> what a, and what a magical fit. I mean, yeah. that's a great story. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> He's awesome. At this time, so you're piecing the band together, and uh, are you you doing originals and, and playing covers? Or how is, what was on your mind then musically? Well, the first thing we do, we do, we pick songs that were from people that were already rocking out. We love Sly Stone, and I remember, you know, we smoked a little green thing and went to a show and watched uh, uh, Woodstock like oh, six right. times in a row, and we just wanted to see Sly Stone and, and who else was, uh, let's say, guitar player, Alvin Lee. Right. You know, he was just burning, carrying a watermelon off stage, you know. Right, right. <laughs> It was awesome, you know, we just loved it, and they were just, you know, freaking out and playing just like how we wanted to play. So that's what we did. We took Ike and Tina Turner songs and, you know, and juiced them up and right. some Sly Stone songs and did them our own way, and everything was an interpretation, even then. But we were trying to learn how to play 10 songs so we could go play a club, you know, and uh, we stayed down in Fort Lauderdale for probably a year and a half, I guess lived there in a house and band house and everything, practiced every day, and uh, and really had a clear idea that, you know, what was happening and what we were doing was working, too. People were coming, the locals, and, you know, we were being friends with everybody and just having a great time, you right. know, no, no doubt about it. And um, in this place called The Flying Machine. In fact, I wrote a song on my uh, uh, an album. I got a, a, a um, solo album out. My newest one is called Two Ton Message. There's a song on called Flying Machine, and it's got a story about some of the stuff that we did then. It was awesome. Is that you know, right? That this little club was, uh, you know, just unbelievable. Well, I mean, it's it's incredible. And and you guys eventually got to release that that first record in uh, I guess around seventy two. Well, uh, it was later than that. We were it? together till like seventy four, seventy five, till we got the first deal with. Uh, R well, no, no, I guess you're right. You're talking about RCA. Yeah, I'm sorry, RCA. I, I yeah. said MCA, yeah. The yeah. yeah, it's hard to even consider that a record deal because that whole thing was so screwed up and we didn't really know what we were doing. It was our first time walking into a studio, really. Right. And uh, we gave it a shot, though. You know, we wrote some songs. It was original. Okay, we, we could do that. <laughs> I mean, the record's got a... I, I love the record. I mean, it's got a great sound that's unique, and obviously it's it's starting the path that you guys went on. Uh, yeah, that's true, and that's the good that came out of it, you know. But the heartbreak was we got in there, and, they, and the guys that were producing it took it and, and added horns. Oh, and, right. You know, jacked it all around without, you know, considering what we thought about it. Is and that when right? we heard it, man, uh, you know, it just... It was just so different than what we had, you know, in the first place, and they and they and they're so inconsiderate of them that you know it was just we said this is not happening, so we just let it run its course, and it took another three or four years before we were ready to try it again, and that's when we got with. Uh, was that epic? Epic, yeah. Right. I, I mean, epic. The, the epic. Uh, you know, the time that you guys were there. I mean, that's when things started to really 
kind of take off. I mean, you guys must have been excited, especially after the whole deal with RCA, to get on a label that's kind of be allowing for you to do what you wanted to do. Uh, what was that experience like for you guys? I mean, were you excited about this, or, or was there a little bit of uh, kind of tension between the label and trying to figure things out? No, because we said screw the label. You know, we were through with them. We could do whatever they wanted to do. We just had to ride the contract out. And right. we actually recorded two records. Uh, and the first one got released, the one that everybody knows. And there's another one that didn't get released that's on the shelf and done. And I think it's out there someplace, but it, somebody, you know, finally got the tapes and put it out there. But uh, right. we concentrated on being a band and playing live. I said, the way we're going to make money, you know, there's no guarantee in the record business, we were thinking. So let's get out and be the best that we can. And, uh, you know, we just played. By then, we'd moved to Atlanta in 72 and uh, because there were gigs in all directions. Of you course. Know, Florida, Florida you kind of bottleneck down in there. And uh, we played and played and played. It's North and South Carolina, you know, and Georgia, the Southeast was our place. And we just constantly played, and we just got a big following, you know, locally before we had a record. And when we finally put a record out, the Southeast bought it up, all, you know, really fast, you know. And uh, that was good because there was enough record sales to guarantee another record, and, uh, and, and we automatically had a crowd and better gigs and, you know. And it was awesome, man, because then, you know, we were warming up for people, and then, and we played so much. I mean, we were dangerous, man. You didn't want to get on stage and try to follow us. <laughs> right. Well, you know, that's that's something I wanted to bring up, because, I mean, you guys are, I, I mean, I, dare I say the word infamous for being one of these groups that kind of upstaged a lot of the headliners. I mean... Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, to us, it was, you know, it was blood and guts. But, right. I mean, you know, it was all outside of music. It was like, you know, we're going on a stage, and, you know, this is our stage, and that's all there is to it, period. You know, and that's all we could see. And we blinded ourselves like that, and we were completely unique in that way. You know? Right. We didn't notice what was going on, but it, as it turns out, you know, some of the places we played, we played here in, a, in town with Aerosmith one time at the Omni, and uh, I had people driving past my house, you know. <laughs> you know, so you guys killed Aerosmith, you know. And we, we didn't really, but, you know, it's just, if you get that thing, it's like we tried so hard, and to get that kind of adulation is... Uh, really makes you feel good. Oh, you know? absolutely. I mean, a couple people say that's all that matters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, really. that matters. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I mean, it's interesting, you know, now in 2017, uh, you know, you look on YouTube, if you look at any Mother's Finest, like, li you know, live recording or, or, or album recording, when you read the comments, most people are saying, you know what, I saw them in 78, I saw them in 77 or what, what, whatever era, and they're like, and I don't even remember who the headliner was. And that, it happens yeah. so many times. Yeah. So that's, just, a, that's a really big compliment. I'm humbled by it, man, because we are really ultimately so very lucky to have the kind of life that we've had and still be going on 47 right. years of this, and we can still stand to look at each other, and we love to get on stage, man. It's like a, a, a little, you know, muscle memory. It's like doing exercise over and over and over and over again, 10 hours a day for a month, and pretty soon you can do it and you know your body responds you just say boom and it's there you right. can jump 10 feet how did you uh get started as a guitar player what, what was the first kind of musical moment uh that you remember as a kid when you were like you know what i want to play music yeah well my father played uh played bass in a country western band where i was on the radio and i'd right? seen him play and he had the band set up in the living room, and uh, I don't remember ever seeing him rehearse, really, but I remember walking through there in the daytime and seeing microphones and wires and, you know, drums and a bass guitar and always these instruments around, so it was like, that, that was okay, you know, that was accepted. Everybody must have this. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, he bought me a guitar somewhere along the line, and I just sat in my bedroom. I was about 12 years old and just uh, learned every song that came on and tried to play it, you know, for months and months and months. What happened and, uh, when he went over to a friend's house and you were like, hey, where's your piano and drums and guitar? <laughs> That's exactly right, man, because, I mean, I, I was still young when I had all this influence, you know, <laughs> and I just thought that was natural. That was what everybody did, you know, and it's, no, it's really special. I'm glad, you know, I'm, I'm appreciative of him for giving me that, just being what he was, you know, because it's, it's not really easy being a musician, you know, right. kind of like bucking all the rules right out of the gate, you know. Absolutely. I mean, so, and, and it's and it's you know it's it's something you kind of learn, and it's a path, and and a lot of you know a lot of parents, I, I would imagine, uh, you know, when rock and roll kind of became huge, 
you know, they probably weren't uh, recommending that the children <laughs> yeah, try to go into that, that pastime. Oh. So, I mean, it's... Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so it a, turns into something else, too. I mean, you know, rock and roll is like the popular kind of music and stuff, too. It's not even music anymore. It's a lifestyle that uh, grown-ups are afraid of, you know. Right. It's associated with all bad things, and if you do this, you know, you're going to go to hell, and, uh, you know... Which is none of that is true, but it's just things that people say to try to scare you because something about it scares them. A lot of the mother's finest, uh, a lot of the songs and subject matter, there is a, 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 a slight tone of um, anti-establishment, kind of anti... Uh, there's a little bit of like, you know, us versus them uh, kind of, um, you know, lyrical content and things. Was that something that, uh, you know, you guys consciously spoke about or talked about I mean, obviously, because you have such a group that's so dynamic, and I would imagine that, you know, labels and things want to classify you, or pigeonhole you, or put it in, you know, put you in a box, so to speak. Was that something that you guys thought about? Yes. I, I mean, we live with it, you know, and it was mainly because most of the members of the band are, are black. Right. And uh, so automatically, even with our first deal with Columbia, they weren't sure where to put us because we were black and a white band were playing rock music, and it just wasn't an easy slot, you know, back in those days. Right. Uh, it was easy if you were just R&B, you know, and your color, your skin was black, and they had a slot at Walmart they could put your record in, and it would be guaranteed that people would see it because they'd know where to look. And our record, you know, they didn't know what it was. They didn't know whether to call it rock. And if they did, it would be, it would seem out of place, you know. Right. So what they ultimately did, because we'd had a following in the Southeast already, was just back off every place else. They put the record out and, and just all they had to do was put it in the stores in the Southeast and it sold really well. But they didn't uh, promote it in, uh, you know, on the West Coast. They didn't promote it up North. And because of that, you know, we had to spend years just kind of going back and trying to introduce it, and we become like an underground band to those people, you right. know? And it's, um, and which is okay, you know, underground's all right. You know, the music is the music, and however it gets out there is, you know, must be the way it's supposed to go, you know? Right. Well, you know, and there's, there's just something to be said about, I mean, what you guys were doing, as specifically at the time, and also... I mean, the the credit must go to how much you guys influenced the, the following generations. I mean, some of the stuff, like I, I take, for instance, the Iron Age record that came out in 81. I mean, that is, you know, it's hard, hard rocking. Uh, you know, it's stuff that you wouldn't, it took another 15 years for that to kind of, uh, to be the norm in, in a lot of like the harder rock and metal uh, yeah. arenas. And that's... No <laughs> we love to play that record too, just because it was like that, and and it was so abnormal. You're right, because uh, a lot of people weren't doing that, man. They come on in here, but I mean, it was like they would just start grooving from the first beat, man. Right. We took tore the roof off of places, you know. Playing that stuff got so intense, you know. And it was just it was built like that to be nothing. It was more physical than anything else, you know. Obviously, you guys, you know, when you guys went to Europe. And you're playing and doing uh, European uh, shows everywhere. The European audience has got it. And to this day, the, they've stuck with the group. Uh, it's a, there's a big, big following there. You know, yeah. what, what was that like when you guys first went over to Europe and you're seeing guys outside of your own country responding the way that they did so passionately to the music? Well, that was awesome. I'll tell you, the first gig that we did was a TV show called Rock Palace, and this was in 78, and we'd been traveling on the airplane for a long time. Everybody was exhausted and tired, but we had to do it the same day we got there. And uh, we just walked into the place not even knowing what the first gig was. And it was like a you know, seven or 8,000 seat uh, coliseum looking place. And uh, it turns out it was a radio show, and that, that night, six million people were going to see it. Jeez. And uh, and we and we had no idea. We just walked in and let's come on, let's get to this, and so we can get to the hotel. You know, we tried. We got there. It was a great show because the people were, you know, right off the bat, they just loved it, and they would just responded to everything that we did. And we had a great show, and it was on tape, and they had video cameras, and that one show introduced us to Europe. You know, by the next week, you know, we had gig offers that were just you know three times as much that we agreed to come there for. Right. You know? wow. yeah, I mean, that show really kind of just. You know, put you guys on, uh, uh, you know, on the on the map there for that. I mean, it's and yeah. people people still refer to that show as being one of the, you know, one of the best shows from that series. And oh yeah, because anytime you hear somebody like your friend that said he saw us in seventy seven or seventy eight, it was seventy eight. It was a rock palace show. I just bet you. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
because you know that's what everybody's influenced. That's still out there, and you can Google it and, and YouTube it and stuff, and that's what pops up. And uh, it was a great show, and the color was great, and everybody was jamming hard, and you know, uh, it, it, it was just like putting out an album, you know, and right. people loved it. It, it, and we were so lucky, man. We just walked into that. You know, there's no planning. You can't plan anything that cool. <laughs> right. I mean, I love the fact that you guys, I mean, you not knowing what it was, that you didn't have time to be nervous. Right? Yeah, we yeah. did, man. We walked out on stage, and we did not give a damn because, right. you know, we were too tired to. And we got up there, and, it was, you know, and when you get on stage... I think it's a trend, you know, just before you walk on stage. I mean, you musicians out there might know this, but, you know, you're like, I'm so tired. I don't know if I can get through this. Where am I going to get the energy? And then, you know, two seconds after you put your foot on the stage and people respond, there's this jolt of electricity that goes through you, and, and you know, you're up for two days, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and that's how it was, too, man. We got up there, and it was such a great show because everybody was relaxed into it, you know, and... Uh, we had plenty of energy, you know, and so everybody can do a show and miss a you know night's sleep. It's not a big deal. Right. But we were just whining, so we're so tired. <laughs> <laughs> but, and we got up there and played, and those people responded, and oh, it was great. You know, I guess about two years ago, you guys completed a, a, a recent new record that was, I mean, it's probably the first record you guys have done as a group in, in several years, and it was a, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a crowdfunded record uh, right. that came out. C tell me, uh, uh, the name of the record's Goody Two Shoes and the Filthy Beasts. Right. Tell me how this record came about and how you guys decided to kind of come back together and, and, and do the whole thing again after taking such a long break. Yeah, well, after we'd had such a long break, everybody had, you know, some songs they wanted to try out, you know, and, and we did this crowdfunding thing. We had no idea how that was going to turn out. It was kind of a long shot. And these days, you know, it's hard to get a record deal. And for a band like ours, too, we're so old that, uh, you know, the record companies don't even look at it as like the popular current thing. Sure. It doesn't have a chance because, you know, people are listening. They have to be 19 years old or something and, and beautiful before, you know, you can do a record deal. To me, it's still, you know... The music business and music has to do with your ears, you know. Right, of course. Absolutely. <laughs> Everything else is kind of like a, a game that you play. So I ignore that too. I mean, you have to, uh, and then focus on try to become relevant as far as the music goes. You know, you're only as good as the last thing that you really wrote. Right. Yeah. You know, those are the rules that everybody else applies on you, but it's also the rule you put on yourself. I mean, the music industry has changed so much in the last few years and as you were saying I mean it is about looks and it's about you know everything but talent I think talent is on the lowest lowest rung of the ladder and you got auto tune out there what do you need voices for exactly yeah man. really <laughs> I'll tell you what though man I, it's still down people recognize you know when somebody does something good uh, and I, they get fooled for a little while, then they come back and, and want something real again. And they go through that. They went through it with boy bands. Right. And uh, they went through it with uh, the girl bands, and they went through it with this and that and the other, and the, and the Disney, you know, with personalities and stuff. It's no, no different than it was in the 50s with Frankie yeah. Avalon or something. Sure, yeah. sure. You know, and, uh, and it went through its phases. To me, if it's one way, and it seems to be one way, like kids aren't listening to music, no, then that to me means that it, an opportunity is there and they're going to be ready in a minute to listen to something real. So, you know, go on, do what you do. I can only do one thing, you know. Right. I sit down, try to write and play songs and sing as best as I can. And there's going to be a time that that comes around. And if you haven't followed the trends, then you can come out uh, and people perceive you as a leader. You know? Right. I mean, and, that, and that's it. You know, it's, it's kind of when there's a void and you can kind of fill that void with something, you know, new and innovative and... And that type, you know, that type of thing. And, you know, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we talked about it at the top of the show, uh, about you, you had a couple solo records that you kind of started to work on. 2010, you had Cartoon You, and you mentioned Two-Ton Message in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, and what were those experiences like? I mean, I, I, we were talking about, you know, you, you spend all this time, your identity is kind of wrapped up in Mother's Finest, but the, you have to make that kind of conscious decision to be, you know what, I'm going to, put everything aside and be a solo artist. Was that kind of hard on you? Or were you nervous about doing that? Well, not nervous. It just comes time to do it. I mean, uh, it, it, at this late date, I've looked back and saw that uh, our, our personality is called Mother's Finest. And right. that's what it is. It's a group. And everybody in the band is in the same place. There's no one person that could, you know, if it's not, if you don't 
call it Mother's Finest, he can't really go play a gig. Uh, so, I mean, it's, at this time, when everybody's getting this hold, it's only a matter of time before somebody's going to say, oh, I can't do it anymore. And I, I want to be ready. I want to, you know, I have still plenty of time left. I can make it another 10 years, I bet you. Sure. <laughs> Right. Or so longer. You know. Or longer. You never well, know. Well, or longer. Yeah, well, I'm halfway there. I expect to live to be 120. <laughs> right. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, but it's you have to have to have something of your own that's valid to offer people, man. You can't just come because you played in a band that people like. Has right. No guarantees is going to help you at all, you know. You when you finally comes down to it and people listen, they judge that music for what it is, you know, and how it sounds and how they feel and where it came from. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm writing right now. It's in the last couple of months. I've been writing as much as I possibly can. We've got about eight songs done for the next record. And, uh, man, we got a ni- nice little band. We have a great time playing. And I'm doing, I never have, I haven't been a singer in Mother's Finest at all. A uh, little bit of background on sure. the albums and recording sometimes, but I just haven't tried to do it because the singers we have are so great. So now it's uh, I'm having to hear what my voice sounds like and decide what it is, you know. And uh, I've got my son-in-law working with me to help in the vocalize. He's a rapper. Right. And, I, I, you know, again, you know, you're keeping with... Uh, the the genres and kind of I I wanted to say this earlier you know it's the mother's finest and the and and the work that you are doing it, the genre of mashing up which is something that is kind of uh, more popular with you know on computer work you know with people blending this song with these lyrics that is something that I I kind of attribute to you guys as being one of these groups that were one of the first guys on the scene doing the mashup and and you know you mentioned on your solo record uh, uh, you know, there's there's this kind of funk, there's kind of hard rock, and then there's there's uh, rapping on it, and, and it goes so harmoniously together. Uh, you know, is that? I mean, is it just in your blood to kind of want to just put, you know, be like a, a scientist and just mix things up like that? Well, yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, you have to take, you know, the opportunities that you have offered to you each day when you get up, you know, and the sun shining, and you have your coffee. Right. You look around and say, well, what can I do? <laughs> and that's how it was. My uh, son-in-law walked into my life, you know, because of my daughter, and he turned out to be just a great guy. And I just heard, you know, early on, hey, this guy, he's a rapper, you know, raps downtown and stuff. And it took me a year or so to actually hear something that he's done and let's have, have a chance to talk about it. And he's really good, you know. Um, and I was right in the middle of writing the 210 Message album, and had most of it recorded, and uh, I'd ask if he wanted to come over and put a verse in a few things, and I stretched out some stuff and gave him a place. And, man, it fit together so well, and it, and it sounded so great that it's just a really natural thing. It's like we've been together forever, you know? You said you got about eight tracks done for the for the new record. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have an idea of when you uh, look to hope to get that out? Well, what we're trying to do is finish everything off, the, you know, in the next couple of months. Right. Uh, I mean, I've got a few more tracks that I'm working on hard. If I can get everything done, 10, maybe 12 tracks done, then uh, have that to work with. And my idea was to put out a song a month um, so for the sake of the Internet. Because, I mean, basically, you give your music away anyway. Well, of course. As soon as you put it out, uh, somebody will download it, and then they give it to everybody else, and everybody has it the way that it is in 2017. But what we need is uh, people to listen and like the music and judge it on that. So, I mean, uh, to me, it's like a thing you should give your music away anyway and not be sorry about it, you know, and hurt. <laughs> right. right. And, you know, and if, people, and if people like the record, they're going to come see you play live and they're going to support you in, in those yeah. kind of avenues. I mean, it's... All kinds of opportunities open up. You know, it's popular to have your music put on video games or commercial, but you have to have first, you have to have people to listen. So... I mean, that's why I appreciate doing an interview with you guys because somebody's ears are going to get to him and they say, well, let me check his album out. And if he does and he likes it, I mean, that's one more fan. I'm out there meeting my fans one at a time right. and shaking their hands and telling them who I am and giving them the record. And, uh, you know, and that's how it's got to be for me to have a career. I right. have to get my name has to be a brand name, you know. Uh, do you have any uh, plans maybe to do a, uh, a small tour or come out west even and... Uh uh, with the solo record, you know, that you're planning on? Oh, yeah, definitely. That's in the plan. We're going to play every place. Uh, I mean, the band is really solid now. All the people in it are great. We've got a, it's a nice little story on its own. Uh, but the new songs we're coming out with, I'm really proud of those. And um, we, 
we're trying to make Atlanta our you know home first to try to establish ourselves and get used to being on stage and right. finding out what we can do you know to be a band and uh, and as soon as we can we'll branch out from there you know as soon as there's opportunity as soon as people listen to a song they have to like the music first you know really it's not about being friends I mean you know people might oh, I love Mother's Finest but that's really not going to make them go out and see Moses Mo right right. <laughs> The music has to stand, like I said, on its own, and uh, I think it does. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to be legitimate artists here that put out songs, and if we can become a source of that, then we can have some kind of a future. Right. Uh, you know, the more you do it, the better you get at it. You know, it's a craft, you know, just like being a car mechanic or something. Uh, and if you can take a water pump out, you, you can do it again on the next car in less time. <laughs> so songs are like that. We write them, and each time the experience is like that, it gets to be more efficient, and with Pro Tools around, I have a little studio in my garage uh, that's, I'm really, you know, the more you do it, the more you get after it. And then it's, it's get to the point that, you know, we can put something out. I can get an idea down in a few minutes, you know, it used to take hours. Right. You don't have to wait so, for the tape to rewind. I mean, yeah, that's, that's right. No that's rewind happy. button. <laughs> I mean, that's happy. Why you put the button on that thing anyway? I mean, Okay. <laughs> right. You know, we have a uh, uh, one of our listeners. Who, they they sent in a question. They wanted to know. You know, I mentioned the, you know, the mashup uh, uh, concept, and you guys. You know, there's this one 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 of the most popular songs uh, that I. You know, one of my favorites is the Mickey's Monkey, and it combines a couple of elements here. And I got I had to ask you because you're the man on the guitar with that. The, I, I, am I mistaken? Is that is that the a combination of a, a Led Zeppelin riff and a Smokey Robinson track? How did yeah, how, exactly. how did that come about? Well, we were at Soundcheck, and uh, this is probably seventy-five or six, I guess. Right. Um, and uh, uh, Mickey's Monkey, um, or the Led Zeppelin thing, you know, was da 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 the singer, uh, Murdoch, came up and started singing Lundy Lundy Lie Eye over it. <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> like it, that. It just, it just fit perfectly, and we kept on going, and we made a change right there, and uh, and we were off, man. We we had it arranged in about an hour. Is that right? It, you know, I think that night. <laughs> Is that right? That's pretty cool, man. I mean, it's and it's of course. I mean, it's great riff and it's a great combination. But again, you know, uh, it's something that kids are now doing all of the time with the computer. And <laughs> you guys are doing. You did it, you know, forty some odd years ago. How did you avoid uh, any trouble with? The Led Zeppelin guys, did, did they... Uh... Well, we gave them credit, you know. We didn't just on an album like that, and Smokey Robinson and his part... Is that right? ...licensed this song, yeah. And uh, we still make money, you know, off, when you put it out uh, as your version of it. If that people buying the record, then you make it, and then, you know, you divide the money up to, to wherever it goes. That's, that's, that's incredible, because, I mean, just a classic song, and it's... <laughs> just, to hear, just to hear that you guys just did it right on the spot is kind of... <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, rap has been doing it. They've taken, that's the reason that kids today even know about the, the uh, classic bands, you know, is because the rappers came out and they took the, you know, the very best hooks and the slots out of the songs and repeated it over and over again. Now, because of that, kids know about Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and, you know, just about anybody you can think of, you know, the rap has taken those things because they didn't really have music. They had a spoken word and they needed something with the beat to rap to. So when they picked from that, that was like an education uh, to all the kids that are out listening to the rap. You know, they they may not have known it was the Beatles, but right. you know, later find out about it later. It's like an education, man. And, and those stations don't even exist. I think uh, the big conglomerates bought up all the small radio stations and gave them one uh, playlist. Right and, now, uh, you get twenty artists, and that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and because of that, people have drifted away from radio. Right. Radio used to unite people because, you know, uh, I'll be the one that says it's time, you know, the five o'clock thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, they don't do that uh, right now, you know, because radio is so scattered. They go to the, uh, the satellite radio, you know, on the Internet. And right, stuff. the and, streaming stuff. It yeah. makes, it's very, uh, you know, it's very personal now, and it's not a community. Right. Like, yeah. you, you tune in, you don't call in it. At this hour, the the win tickets, you know that not a lot of that goes on. And as it's much. so programmed too. Like classic rock stations is like you know 
the vault of material that Jimi Hendrix has, but they play like Purple Haze, you know. And every, hey, Joe. Well, every 37 <laughs> minutes on the hour, you can definitely hear Fleetwood Mac or Purple Haze. Or <laughs> right. Yeah, was, well, now you could go and go to the Jimi Hendrix channel. But, you know, if you love, I love Jimi Hendrix, but you know, by the time you listen to it for a day, you know, you're ready to throw up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> just, you, you've heard all the tracks. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of balance there, you know, and that's what they've done. They have a Led Zeppelin and a Beatles station, and, you know, and, and, and it uh, takes away that camaraderie that radio used to have. DJs are out there actually talking and having an opinion and, and putting the human element into the show, you know? Right. Songs are what they are, and everybody knows what they sound like at the times, and you're glad to come because they're like old friends. Uh, but they don't have, they took the human element out, and uh, they kind of screwed up. Well, well, Moses, you know, I know that you guys are you're going to be uh, with Mother's Finest. You guys are going to be heading over very soon to Europe for a, uh, a short tour out there. And then you, you guys are going to be coming back uh, doing some shows in Georgia. I want to uh, thank you, Moses, for, for, for being on the program and, and talking about, you know, your history, talking about uh, Mother's Finest and, and, and the great work that you guys have done. And obviously the solo records, uh, people can... You know, uh, go to mothersfinest.com and also mosesmo.com to, to hear and purchase uh, some of your solo work and find yeah. out when you guys are playing next. Um, mm-hmm. And I also wanted to mention in November, you're going to be playing with uh, our dear friend Thomas Claxton in the Myth down in Savannah, Georgia uh, oh, cool. on, the, on the 17th. And then you're going to be in Buckhead at the Buckhead Theater on the 25th in Atlanta. So mm-hmm. any of our uh, Atlanta listeners... Make sure to go check uh, Moses and Mother's Finest out. And, of course, you have also have a, a solo gig in Atlanta coming up, uh, I believe, in Duluth, uh, yeah. October October 6th, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you're probably right. I, I have to talk to my wife. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I bet you're right, yeah. And if anybody's listening, can come on out and check it out, man. You know, we'll become friends, and we'll have a good thing to do every Saturday night. Go have a beer and see a band. Right. Modern, modern tradition. And if you ever get out here, baby, I would love love to come out and listen to you guys play and watch some of those hot guitar licks, baby. <laughs> no, we'd love to see you come out. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity. and. It's really nice talking to you. Oh, Absolutely, you, Moses. Moses. Well, we we appreciate it, and, and all the best for the for the tour. And uh, make sure to stay safe out there. Oh, we'll do our best, and you guys do the same. You got it. Well, thank you so much. Take thank care, you, Moses. Moses. Take care, brother. All right, Eddie and Bo, see you guys later. Take care, Moses. Moses, Moe. Great human being, man.